read you a message that might answer this person's question. Occasionally I go back to the question pile and I'll just pick one. There's so many questions, I just can't get to all the questions, but I'll just pick one. This came in about four months ago. Hello, Pastor Joe. I have a question that I hope you can help me with. It concerns the scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, where it says, All the promises of God in Him are yea, and in Him, amen, unto the glory of God. I have heard preachers teach that this gives us license to hunt for a promise of God and make it ours. Is this really the case? I mean, I believe, I mean, I believe it, I believe I want it, desperately to believe in it, but I'm having trouble right now. I think my faith is getting a real butt kicking. I have heard from the Old Testament the verse where God says He will never leave us nor forsake us. I saw it in the Old Testament, but somehow I doubted it, that this, is on, that this only applied to the children of Israel. But then when I found it in Hebrews, I was happy and settled. I know and I'm trying my best to live on the belief that God is not a genie in the bottle. He's the boss, and we have to wait on Him. Any insight or direction to teaching you have already done is greatly appreciated. By the way, the preachers teaching about claiming a promise of God are the old-fashioned God-fearing types, not the name it and claim it types. <clears throat> so the question is about 2 Corinthians chapter 120. So let's look at it. 2 Corinthians 1.20 Everybody's probably heard this verse. If you've been a Christian for a while, people use it for all different type of promises that they're hoping to receive. The email says, by the way, preachers teach about claiming a promise of God are old-fashioned God-fearing types, not the same, same it, not the name and claim it types. So <clears throat> let me clarify one thing from the beginning. I'm neither type. I'm neither type. I'm not a name and a claim it. And I'm not the old way of thinking regarding claiming a promise that you can find in the scriptures and then say all the promise of God in Him are yea and in Him amen unto the glory of God by us. <clears throat> the one thing I have encouraged for all of you to do if you listen to me over the years I have said quite often that you have to keep everything in context and you have to be a biblical detective. Sure, I've heard this verse used in two different ways. If you find a promise of God in the Bible, claim it for your own because in Him, amen unto the glory of God. And then I've heard name it and claim it, prosperity type doctrine people misuse this verse also. But I'm telling you, right now, both of those viewpoints are incorrect. I know I have people listen to me that are shaking their heads right now saying, there he goes again. Why can't he agree with anyone from the past, present, and he always has this sidebars? 
Because I'm telling you, for the most part, scholars, preachers, and pastors have been sloppy when it comes to discerning the word and what it has to say. I know that irritates some. But that's just too bad. You're probably here if you've been here for any length of time because what I do is different. I just don't take anybody's word for it. Even if they were a fairly decent scholar, everything has to be proven out. Not that I don't trust people, but when it comes to discerning God's word, you have to be extremely careful. This is not just like reading any book. This is not like reading a textbook or a fantasy book or science fiction or a novel or a biography where you could probably only use a very small part of your brain to get through that material. This takes a never-ending search switch in your brain, mentality. Because the word is that deep. You cannot exhaust its understanding. You're going to always find things that just pop out. When I say things, I mean verses or chapters. That just is like turning on a light in a dark room. And you're going to wonder why I have never seen this before. And of course, the problem with many people is, well, my pastor said this, so this is what I'm going to believe from this point on, without ever checking it out. So back to this verse. What was Paul referencing? Here, for all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen. Now Paul leads up with this, uh, up, up until, uh, until you reach this verse, rejoicing in the testimony of his conscience and the simpl simplicity and not with fleshly wisdom but with the grace of God. We have our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you also. He passes by the Macedonians. And he gets to verse 19, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me, and Svenius and Timothy, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. And then he gets to, For all the promises of God in him are yea, and him, Amen unto the glory of God. And what promises of God? The promises of God that he kept. God, that is, of sending Jesus to fill the promise he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if you just read this scripture alone, of course you're going to put a general concept on it because any time you find a promise of God, all the promises of God in him, in him are yea and in Him amen unto the glory of God. But what was he referring to? Remember, he's talking to a church. A church that he is informing. This is just an additional letter that he wrote to the Corinthians, the, the church in Corneth. Additional letter that solidifies that, yes, God did keep his promise. A promise he made way back 
thousands of years before Paul even penned this letter to the Corinthians. And of course, when you look at Romans chapter 15, you start connecting the dots, what Paul was referring to, which the reader might have a disunderstanding, might, might have a, a different understanding than we do now because we're reading something that's 2,000 years later. We don't have the inside information what he, they, he actually taught when he was in Corinth, what he communicated. And he communicated a lot more than we find in these letters in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. He spent some time there teaching them, establishing that church. When you read Romans 15, the chapter about edifying one another, and you get to, well, Let's just start. With verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promise, promises made unto the Father to confirm the promises made unto the Father, and that the Gentiles might glorify for His mercy, as it is written, for this cause, I will confess to thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto thy name. Paul is writing in this letter in the 14th chapter, talks about judging their brother, and then it goes into Christian liberty, and then he blends it into edifying one another. And then he says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision of the truth of God. He came as a Jew. But when you read in Matthew 15, you don't have to go there, I'm just going to go there quickly. Verse 24, it reads, But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. To the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And Paul says in Romans 15, 8, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God. He came as a Jew to deliver the truth of God that he could provide salvation to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. And I've preached it. And I recommend everyone to read that message or listen to that message. It's available both in print and in video. What Abraham saw when he looked up into the skies and the promises of a Redeemer that would come through his lineage that would save mankind and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy is written for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name to what in verse 8 to confirm the promises made unto the father unto the, the fathers his ministry was confined to the nation of Israel in its totality not to the Jews but also to the Gentiles, as we see in verse 9. He came as a Jew. He fulfilled that promise. He fulfilled that prophecy. But his message is not just to the Jews. It was for the nation of Israel. That's the nation in its totality. And that nation in its totality was not existing in all the tribes, that is, in the year, in the first century, let's just put it that way, 
<clears throat> when Jesus was on this planet. Because those tribes were scattered hundreds of years before that, when they were taken to bondage. Those northern tribes were scattered. They eventually migrated. Few came back. Few went east. Most went west. So his ministry, that's why he had apostles go. That's why Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles. His ministry, Christ that is, was confined to the nation of Israel. Because it would be the nation of Israel that take then the message to the rest of the world eventually. He came in this capacity to confirm the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's what's being confirmed here in Romans 15. And in 2 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 1, this is what it's referencing. For all the promises of God in Him are yea, and in Him amen unto the glory of God. What it was the promise of God? For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us. Even, and it goes into... It was not yea, but nay, but in him was yea. God kept his promise through Paul, through Timothy, and others that the message of the gospel of good news that was promised way back, let's just call them the founding fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, would be fulfilled. And now, but Paul saying, this is the time when those promises of God in him are yea and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. That by us tells you a lot in that verse. God fulfilling his promises of what he promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through us concerning the one that would bring salvation, the one that provided the good news for the lost house of Israel, which then would provide that good news to the rest of the world. So when you take this verse out of context, you can make, make it mean anything you want. But there's promises for other things in the scripture that you're going to deal with in your life. The circumstances that you are going to go through, you can claim promises. Scripture's full of them. But not this verse. This verse is dedicated to something that God promised way back. And we saw the fulfillment of that promise in Jesus Christ. And then we further saw the fulfillment of this promises, promise through the apostles. And even us today. Now, <clears throat> hopefully that answers your question. And if you got it, if you're not the one that answered, asked the question, if this is a different perspective for you, let me know while they play a song. Now I want to hear from you.